1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to go ahead and start in the first verse there of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I guess maybe this morning do more teaching than actual preaching, depending on how the Lord leads. But this is a subject that we need to understand. This subject is something that we need to hear, that we need to, to grasp and get down in our hearts here this morning. There's been a lot of teaching throughout the years on the subject of grace in the church. But that teaching, a lot of that teaching has been wrong teaching. There's a teaching going on right now that says that that because of God's grace, we don't need to confess sin when the Holy Spirit reveals that sin to us. That teaching even goes so far as to say that the Holy Spirit doesn't convict the believer of sin in his life. And just to start this morning, I want to tell you that is wrong teaching. There's been teaching that's gone throughout the church for I don't know how many years that's taught that the grace of God just covers our sin. It's just something like peanut butter and jelly that when we sin, we can just smear the grace of God on it and it covers our sin. There's been the teaching in the church today that says, oh, we live in the age of grace, in the time of grace, and we do. This is, if you would call it, a, the dispensation of the grace of God, and it is. But they take that and say, because this is the dispensation or the time of grace or the age of grace, that God just winks, he overlooks sin in the life of the believer. That he over, oh, I can, oh, God knows my heart. That'll be a, 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 a statement that you hear quite often. With believers and non-believers alike. Oh, God knows my heart. He knows what I really... Yeah, He does know your heart. Mm. You know, you don't even know your heart. That's right. Our heart is deceitfully wicked. Yes. The Word of God tells us. Who can know it? God knows it. But they teach grace in a way that, Oh, I can just sin here and I can sin. It's okay to sin a little bit. It's okay to live in a lifestyle. They take it even that far. That we can live a lifestyle of sin and that God just, oh, it's okay. This is the time of my grace. Mm. That's not, that's turning the grace of God, as yes. the Word of God says, into lasciviousness, yes. into license. Yes. I want to tell you this morning, and we need to understand them this morning from the very outset, that the grace of God is not license to sin occasionally. To live a lifestyle of sin. The grace of God does not give us a, a, a carte blanc or however you want to call it. It doesn't give us the go ahead to sin even a little bit. Mm. Those are the erroneous teachings that have gone through a long time now. Some new, some old. That, uh, uh, about the grace of God. And hopefully this morning when we leave here, we'll understand a little bit better the grace of God. God shed His grace. God showed His grace at Calvary when He sent Jesus to die for our sins. And we've said it and talked about it here before that when we reject that or whenever we try to use that as an excuse to sin. We'll look at it here in a little bit in Romans chapter 5 and 6. But God doesn't just pass it over. That angers God. When we misuse, if you will, the understanding, or we don't understand His grace. His grace is not licensed to sin. But I'm going to tell you this morning, grace, grace, is the power of God to live a life free from sin. You see, when we understand grace as being the power of God, that grace given to us, the ability to live free from sin, 
we no longer see grace as, oh, it just peanut butter and jelly on my sin. You know, it doesn't just cover, but it gives us the power. It gives us the ability. It gives us, through the means of the Holy Spirit, all because of Calvary. And that's what we need to understand as well. Had it not been for Calvary, we would not know the grace of God. Do you understand? I'll just bring this out here just a minute. In the Old Testament, grace is only talked about once or twice, maybe three times in the whole of the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, God's grace is personified in the person of the Holy Spirit. And when we understand the cross, when our faith is placed in Christ and what he's done for us at Calvary, the Holy Spirit then has liberty. He then has authority to go to work in our hearts and our lives. And I'll guarantee you the Holy Spirit's not going to lead you to sin. He's not going to lead you to even sin just a little bit. Say, oh, I didn't sin yesterday, so today I can do something. You know? No. The Holy Spirit is always, grace teaches, teaches us that denying ungodliness, we should live righteously and soberly. Grace is a teacher. It's personified there. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, would lead and guide, direct us into all truth. So as we go through this this morning, this teaching, let's understand we need to know what the grace of God is. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 10. And then we'll get started. Moreover, brethren, Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which, also, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for the blood that was shed at Calvary that's given to us all things for life and godliness. Father. Lord, I ask that you would take the next few minutes, Lord, as we look into your word, as we mm. seek to understand more of who you are and what you've done for us, Father, that you would teach us, that you would lead us and you would guide us, Father, into this grace that you have for us. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. It was not empty, Paul would say. His grace did not have no effect. You see, Paul is telling us here, he's showing us here that the grace of God has a work. It has an effectual work to do in our hearts and in our lives. The grace of God is not just something that sets idle in the life of the believer. Too much we have looked at grace as just something that's out there and that it comes automatically to us. 
No, grace is the effectual working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. Grace can be bestowed, can be given to us in vain. How is it given to us in vain? It's in vain whenever we don't allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in us. When we don't let the Holy Spirit have His way. And why is it that we don't? A lot of times it's because we don't believe. It's because we're not trusting. You see, whenever we come and we begin to understand the message of the cross, we begin to understand all that Jesus Christ has done for us, and we then place our faith in what He's done for us at Calvary, that gives the Holy Spirit, that gives the grace of God, the legal means, it gives it the avenue whereby the Holy Spirit can work in the heart and the life of the believer. And I'm going to guarantee you this morning that as the Holy Spirit goes to work in your heart, and in your life, He will never, ever lead you to an attitude or to a position that says, Oh, God's grace covers my sin so I can go about and just do my own thing. You got to do that before you were saved. That's right. You made a mess out of your life then. The grace of God teaches us. That's where it's personified in the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit. Who brings that grace, that teacher, that power source. You see, before Calvary, God could only, He could only pour out His grace in a limited measure upon certain individuals for a certain time. He could only empower them to do a certain work because the sin debt hadn't been paid. He could only do it for a little while there in the Old Testament, for a certain task. But today, in this age of grace, the Word of God tells us that before God winked at sin, but now He calls all men to repentance. Because we have such the, so much grace, because, because God's grace is shed abroad in our hearts and in our lives today, we don't have an excuse to sin. Especially the believer. This teaching in the church that says, Oh, the Holy Spirit doesn't convict the believer of sin is a lie. All right. It's from the enemy. I want to tell you this morning that unconfessed sin hinders your walk with the Lord. Yes. Right. You hear what I'm saying this morning? I didn't say that you'll lose your salvation because you sinned over here a little bit. But I do say, I will say, and based upon the Word of God, that whenever we sin, if we just sit, oh, that's no big deal, push it aside, that hinders our walk with the Lord. He is not able to work in our hearts and our He will do everything He can, but He will He can only do it to a certain point. Yes. Yep. Because we're harboring sin. We've got this weight that Paul would call it would call it that besets us, that holds us back. You see, we're trying to drag around, we've talked about in the past, the old man. We're trying to drag around the things of this old life, that dead, stinking old man. We've thrown him over our shoulder, if you will. We've put him on our back like a backpack and he's weighing us down. He's keeping us. From the things of the Lord. You know, whenever I got saved, I don't know about you. But when I got saved and I gave my life to Christ, I felt that weight of that old man be lifted off of me. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I was saved. I was a new creation in Christ Jesus. Paul says, put off the old man. You can't put off the old man except by the grace of God. Grace, the enabling power of the Holy Spirit at work in your heart and life. And like I said, if it's the Holy Spirit working in you, working on you, working through you, because of what we know of the Holy Spirit, He has that legal right because our faith is placed in Christ and Him crucified. The Holy Spirit will never lead you to sin. Even a little bit. 
There are things in our hearts and our lives, even after, after we come to Christ, even as we've placed our faith in Christ, even as we are doing all that we know to do as far as the, the object of our faith and the, the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit, there are still things in our hearts and our lives. I think we called them here a while back, the trumpet vines. Those things that are hard to kill. You know, we brought out that that's a, that is a hard thing to kill, the trumpet vine. I don't know that you've ever tried it, but I have. Had some growing up on a fence one time. It wouldn't die. Roundup wouldn't kill it. It takes the power of the grace of God working in our hearts and our lives to even expose those vines. There are some things there that you don't even know right now. In each of our hearts and our lives, those things that remain from that sin nature, from the fall, that left to ourselves, we would never even think about rooting them out. You know, Jesus talks about taking the axe to the root. That's what the Holy Spirit has to do. He has to take that axe and he does it and it's the grace of God. You hear what I'm saying? It's God's grace that allows him, that enables him, that empowers him to go to work, the Holy Ghost gardener, if you will taking that acts of grace to our hearts and our life because he knows it's not good for us. He knows what's hindering our walk with the Lord. And in each one of us, there are things there, even after having been saved, that are a hindrance to us. There are things we pick up. Sue mentioned a little bit of it this morning. There's some things we pick up as we go through this life. Those things of the world that come around and bombard us and try to attach to us. Yes, yes. You know, you go into the convenience store down the road. You don't smoke or anything. Or you go into a place, a restaurant where they allow it. Have you ever noticed whenever you don't smoke, you're in the presence of it. It's like it just... <laughs> Sucks to sucks and attaches to you. You walk out of that place and you stink. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what we have as we go throughout this world. I want to tell you, as a believer, whenever you've been in the Word of God and you're studying His Word, and then for whatever reason the things of this world come around, and and we're going through this 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 world, you know, that's why Jesus said you don't need to to wash all this, but just your 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 feet. You see, he doesn't have to wash us again. Our feet and our hands, he has to... Well, because of the walk that we walk. We're walking in this world. We need that continual cleansing of the blood of Christ in our hearts and in our lives. That's what the Holy Spirit's job is, is to, to get to those things, to find those things, to seek out those things in our hearts and in our life, to go through our house and get every little bit of leaven that he can find to get it out. Because it hinders your walk with the Lord. Grace never allows you to sin as you will. Grace is the power of God for you and I to live free. Not only from the dominion of the sin nature, but to live free from those little foxes that spoil the vine. Those things that creep in, those things that come in even unknown to us, those things that are there ever to bring us into a closer relationship with the Lord. Isn't that what we all want? More than anything else, that should be the desire in every believer's heart and life. What did Paul say? That I might know him more. That I might know, that I might know what it is that Christ has done for me more and more. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing for you and I. Teaching us, yes, yes. leading us. That's what God's grace gives to him, to us. The power of the Holy Spirit. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. Mm -hmm. But the grace 
of God which was with me. That tells us right there. Like I said, that grace isn't just something that happens automatically. That grace isn't just there for, for to be applied every time or whatever. But grace works. Grace gives you and I through the power of the Holy Spirit. And remember, it all comes because of Calvary. But grace gives us. Grace enables us to do the work that God has for us to do. Mm -hmm. We need his enabling grace. And we're talking about sanctification here. We need his enabling grace that we might do that which he has called us to do. And it comes to us only by means of the cross. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We got a lot of reading to do there. I love reading his word. Whether y'all like it or not. Second Corinthians chapter six and verse one. We then, as workers together with him, we then, the apostles, the prophet, you and I, the believer, as workers together with him. Jesus has given us, God has given us the privilege to be workers, to be a part, to take part in this message of the cross, to take part in taking this message to the world. He has given us that privilege to be workers together with Him. We then, as workers together with Him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. What's vain mean? Meaningless. Empty. Void. You see, what this word says in one way, it says as well as another. We can be a recipient of God's grace and it be in vain. Whenever, for whatever reason, we're not looking to Christ. You see, he's speaking to believers here. They receive that grace of God for salvation. And when we receive it for salvation... Then God has more grace for us for sanctification. More grace. More of the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. He says that you receive not this grace of God in vain. Meaningless. We receive it in vain whenever we allow our faith to be misplaced. When we put our trust in something other than Christ and what He did for us at Calvary. We have received God's grace and it means nothing. Whenever we allow the enemy to steal that faith, to move that faith that we've had yeah. from Christ to something else. Whenever something comes along and they look so good. He's speaking of religion here. Whenever we, we, we think that because we do something, because I've done something, I've earned favor with God, because I, I, I did this thing in this way, this ritual, we receive the grace of God in vain. The Holy Spirit can't work in our hearts and lives whenever our faith is in what we're doing. You hear what I'm saying? That's why we fight the good fight of faith. We got to be constantly on guard, making sure that I'm not trusting in my doing, even the doing of my good but that I'm trusting in Christ and what He has done. It's not about what would Jesus do. It's about what Jesus has done. Amen. Are you keeping your faith there? Yes. Are you looking to Him? Verse 2, He said, For He saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as ministers of God in patience, in affliction, in necessities, in distresses. Paul goes on and on here in these, these next few verses showing that God's grace that the grace that the Holy Spirit brings to us, that the enabling of the Holy Spirit gives to us, He's going to enable us 
to go through these times, to go through these distresses, to go through these trials. We've got to have the enabling power, the grace of God to be able to withstand. As he said there in 1 Corinthians, that we would stand in this grace that we have. We've got to have God, the power of the Spirit, because we are all going to go through these things. It's not going to be if you go through. It'll be when. At what time. And it doesn't mean you're just going to see it once or twice. It's going to be ongoing. More and more. And the, the closer you get to the Lord. Jesus said they hated me. They're going to hate you. Right. You get that. Is it any wonder. That this world today. They're trying to silence the voice of the church. The true church. They're trying to throw the Bible out. They're trying to get it out of every area of, the, of their lives. Even in America. <clears throat> we think that we're immune from the, some of this stuff. All you need to do is listen to the news. Yes. They've got a bill or something before Congress or the Senate right now that's the Equality Act. Mm -hmm. And this equality thing that they're talking about is everybody's equal except the believer, mm -hmm. except the preacher of the gospel. The whole guise of that thing is to shut the church up. It says you can't preach against sin. It says you can't tell the homosexual that his lifestyle is a lifestyle of sin and that it's going to lead him to, to an eternity in hell. Oh, that's hate speech. That's what it's all about. The world is constantly trying to shut the church up. You know, I don't know about you, but I think about some things once in a while. Yo, know, what is it? They're not trying to throw the Quran out. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to throw out the books of Confucius if they got any. Mm -hmm. Any of the false religions of the world. They're not trying to throw those things out. The only one, the only book they're trying to get rid of. The only group, they would call it a religion, that they're trying to get rid of is that which holds to this word. Yes. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you're a believer, you're the scourge of the earth. So they think. <laughs> Amen. You know, there was a time whenever they took the believers and they hunted them down. They burned them at the stake and they cut their heads off. That time's coming back. Amen. Only by God's grace. Hallelujah. The enabling Jesus. power of the Holy Spirit are we going to be able to stand in such a time. If we don't see it, I'm talking about us olders, I bet our kids will, our grandkids. Yep. Mm -hmm. We need to be passing along to them. I said this here a few weeks ago. We need to be passing along to them the foundations of this gospel. We need to be passing along to them a determination to hold to Jesus Christ and Him crucified, to not look to any other. The homosexual says, oh, you can't tell me I have to change but because I was born this way. Mm -hmm. Yo, well, how can you change the way you're born? But he says, you got to change what you're preaching. It's hypocritical. I can't change this, but you have to change what you're telling me. Right. The choice. You know, they're, they're both a choice. Mm -hmm. We choose to come to Christ. The homosexual is not born a homosexual. He's born in sin with maybe a tendency towards that, mm -hmm. but it's a choice that they make just like we made a choice to be saved mm -hmm. to put our faith in Christ by the grace of God we've got to teach our children we've got to allow our children to understand and to know that they can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit we got to teach them what grace really is grace isn't license grace is power grace is strength Grace is ability through the Holy Spirit. You see, the church today doesn't want to acknowledge the Holy Spirit. They don't want to acknowledge the cross. For the most part, they're nothing but religion. Anything that doesn't put trust and faith in Christ and Him crucified is religion. 
religion won't save you. Religions change. Look at Catholicism. It changes. It changes with the culture. I hear a lot of talk about we got to change the culture today. No. We got to change men's hearts. Yes, have to be changed. Yes, Only when hearts and lives are changed will there be any other cultural change that takes place. The church today is so busy, so 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 busy going about trying to affect the culture when we need to be going about affecting the hearts and the lives of men. And the only way to affect men's hearts and lives is by the preaching of this gospel. They don't want it. They're trying to cast it out. we got to hold fast to it. So he goes on down through here, and he's, he's telling them over and over, you know, how that they're going to go through these things. He says in verse 11, O ye Corinthians... Our mouth is opened unto you. Our heart is enlarged. You are not straightened in us, but you are straightened in your own bowels. That, what that, what's that mean, you're not straightened in us? He says, we're not telling you how you should live. We're not telling you. We are not your power source. We're not the ones saying you must live this way. You must keep your faith in Christ and Him crucified. He says, you are straightened in your own bowels. He's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit there in their lives. He's talking about grace. In the life of the believer, these Corinthians were believers. And that straightened is talking about the narrow way that we have in Christ Jesus. He said, we don't have to tell you. He says, the Holy Spirit will lead you. He will tell you by the grace of God how you should live. You understand that this morning. You don't necessarily have to go about They don't want this word because this word tells them. This word proclaims, thus saith the Lord. This word lays out what is sin. Yes. in our lives that's that straightening that's that, that confining that's that constraining is what that word straighten means it constrains us in the grace of God the grace of God this day of grace that we live in is not a day of license we are much more responsible today to live a life of holiness than ever before, ever in the Old Testament, <clears throat> because His grace has come yes. to show us the way. Amen. There's no excuse. You hear what I'm saying? There's no excuse for your sin. Even those things that we don't know, when the Holy Spirit reveals it, we don't say, oh, but, 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 mm. we need to be saying, oh, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Oh, wretched man that I am. When the Holy Spirit reveals those things to us, that straightening, that constraining power of the Holy Spirit, and we will, if our faith is placed in Christ and what he did for us at Calvary, we can't help but walk that straight and narrow way that he talks about. You hear what I'm saying here? Not out of law, not out of out of out of ritual, but out of the Holy Spirit working in us. Do you understand the Holy Spirit will never lead you to anything but the cross? He will always point you to Christ, who He is and what He's done. He will always direct you there. Whenever the Holy Spirit finds something in us. He's going to direct us to the cross. He's going to direct us to that place where our, our, our redemption was purchased. He's going to direct us to that place where the blood can be applied and we can be washed whiter than snow. The Holy Spirit will always lead you to Calvary. And Calvary will always bring you once again the help and the enabling power. It will always lead you back to the Holy Spirit because we've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God working in our lives, Amen. teaching us, leading and guiding us into all truth. There is no truth outside of the cross. You hear me this morning? 
There's no truth outside of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's right. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And ain't nobody going to get to the Father except by Him. Amen. You're not going to go to Him by your denomination, by your good works, as good as they might be. Do you realize you can do all the good works in the world and if you're trusting in those works, you're going to spend eternity in hell. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa, so they call her mother, whatever that's supposed to mean, she didn't even know if she was saved. Right. Mm -hmm. She made the comment she didn't even know before she died. She wasn't sure. You realize religion doesn't give any assurance of salvation, but by the grace of God, we can have that assurance. That's right. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. We can have assurance by the grace of God, by what he has done for us. You are not straightened in us, but you are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. Be ye also enlarged. Another aspect of grace there. And that's what Paul is speaking of here because what he said in verse 1, but that grace of God in it, it says, now for a recompense, now for a something of the other side, I speak as, as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be enlarged, be expounding, be growing in your understanding of Christ and what he's done for us at Calvary. You see, that's the job of the Holy Spirit. He will always be enlarging to us. He will always be expounding to us what it is that Christ has done for us. We will never, never realize, we will never know all of what Jesus has done for us at Calvary. But the Holy Spirit, because of his, his enabling power, because of the grace of God working in us, the Holy Spirit will always, if our, if our faith remains in Christ, He will always be leading us to more and to more. He will be enlarging. He will be expounding. He will be growing us more and more <clears throat> in our understanding of what Jesus has done for us at Calvary. I'm going to tell you, in each and every one of our lives, in my life, as I have, as I have studied more, as I have grown more in the message of the cross, I see more and more. And why does He enlarge it to us? He enlarges it to us so that our faith might be more and more. Ten years ago, I didn't think anything of the perfection of God. But as the Holy Spirit has been revealing that to me, I see that everything that he has is perfect. Right. He fails not in any respect and that I can trust him. You see what I'm saying? I'm trying to pass along to you what he's been showing me. So it doesn't take you 10 years to realize it. See, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be the partaker first. And then I pass it on to you so that you can say, ah, I get it now. And so that your faith can grow. And so that we can pass it on to our children and to our grandchildren. And so that their faith can grow. I said, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago, if, if, if we would pass on to them what we learn, how much more will they be operating in the power of the Holy Spirit when they're our age? If our elders had passed on to us what they had learned. You see, that's part of the problem in the church. I brought out the other day that the church in the 40s or the, 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 the nation in the 40s and the 30s and back in then, the 65 or so percent of them identified as being a believer, being a Christian. But then in just the next generation, only half as many. And in the next generation after that, only half as many again. We haven't passed on the faith. Right. We haven't passed on. We haven't preached Christ and Him crucified to our children. Because we haven't had it preached to us. But God's bringing it back. He's given it to you and to me. So that we can pass it on. And as we pass this on. 
by the grace of God, the enabling power of the Holy Spirit can go to work in their hearts and in their lives. And we're, we're, we're living in a time when we're going to see the book of Acts. The miracles. We're going to see the persecution too. You don't have the, the, the miracles, if you will, without the persecution. We're going to see the early church, however you want to look at it. When we talk about the book of Acts, the, what God, we're going to see a people. We're seeing right now the sprout, if you will, of the tree. But there's going to, God's going to raise up a people in this end time. They're going to hold to nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Amen. It's going to be a witness to this world. And they're going to hate them even more. They hated the early church. But we got to get our kids ready. we got to get ready. It's coming. It may not be ten years away. But it's coming. Are we going to stand in this grace that God has given us? Are we going to stand with our faith firmly planted resting in Christ and Him crucified. If we will, see I say if, because it's conditional. Mm -hmm. The enemy's going to try to pull us away. Mm -hmm. But if we'll refuse to know nothing, say Jesus mm -hmm. Christ and Him crucified, then the Holy Spirit's going to go to work mightily. He's planting little churches. He's planting bodies of believers all over this nation. He's planting them here. He's planting them there. We're, we're, we're being a part. Even us here in this little church now, we're having a part to play down there in Wichita Falls and being able to plant a church down there that preaches the message of the cross. He's planting His churches. He's planting a group of believers in different areas of the city, of the towns, of the nation because He's getting us ready. He's going to move in a mighty way. He's going to move in our hearts and our lives. Revival is here. Do we recognize it as such? Are we allowing Him to revive us? Do you hear what I'm saying? This revival is the message of the cross. It's just gaining steam more and more as the power of the Holy Spirit goes to work in our hearts and our lives. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. Be ye also enlarged. Yes. Do you want more? Are you asking him, Lord, show me more. Yes, Lord. Teach me more. He goes on here in verse 14. We made mention of this here a couple of weeks ago. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Mm. For what, has fe what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has the he that believes with an infidel, an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in in them. He's still speaking about grace here. He says, I will dwell in them and be in them. I will dwell in you. Has there anything more wonderful than to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts and in our lives? Is there anything more, more, more privileged? The God who sits on high, whose throne is above every other throne. Right. Is there any greater privilege than to have Him indwelling us by the means and the power of His Holy Spirit and His grace operating, working? Grace is not just sitting there idle, waiting to be covering something that we do oh, wrong. Amen. Grace is the power of God working, working, working in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. Let the grace of God do its work in you. That's right. You hear me this morning? Yes. His grace is power. His power. 
working in us, working on us, working through us. It's that sanctifying power, that power setting us apart is what he's talking about here. Be not unequally yoked together. What, what relationship does Christ have with the devil? Mm -hmm. The church today has entered into all kinds of relationships with the world. They've entered into all kinds of communions and all kinds of, of, of joint ventures. They, they brought in the things of the world today because they don't know the power of the grace of God working in their hearts and in their lives. If we did, we would know to, 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 to turn away from the things of this world, to come out from among them. Grace gives us ability. We don't need the things of this world. We've got the very power of God living in us, working through us. What a shame it is for the church. I shame the church. Shame on you, church. Whenever you take up psychology and marketing schemes to grow the church, God don't need your help. He's all powerful. God will add daily to the church such as should be saved. Our job is to go forth and preach this gospel. To say, hear ye the word of the Lord. Repent. Amen. That's right. And on that note, repent ain't a bad word. That's right. Repent is a good thing. To tell somebody you need to repent yes. is the best news they could ever hear. Because if you're saying repent, that means God has a way yes. of repentance. Yes. You see, in this age of grace that we're living in today, we have no excuse to remain in our sin. God has given us the way out. God has given us the redemption of our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. You have no excuse today, church. You have no excuse to remain living even a little bit of sin. And I'm not saying you're going to be sinlessly perfect. But you are going to be saying, oh God, search me. Yes. You're going to be saying, Lord, search me and know me and see. Find out those wicked ways. Find those trumpet vines, God, yes. that are in my heart and in my life. Find that leaven that is in my heart and in my life. Search me out, God. I don't want to see as a believer. A believer doesn't want to sin. A believer hates sin. A believer abhors sin. He has the same attitude towards sin that God has towards it. And he says, I don't want it. Not even a little bit. I don't want to cuss a little bit each day. Don't need to. If you're cussing, you need to figure a better way to communicate. Yep. You hear what I'm saying? Check your heart. Yeah. Mm. Out of the abundance of the heart, the, heart. Mm -hmm. the mouth speaks. Yeah. The enabling power of the Holy Spirit. He's what makes it possible for us to be not yet, yet be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We don't need any fellow. We don't need any union. We got to touch them. He's not talking about going to a monastery, going up on a mountain and building a temple and staying away. How are you going to evangelize that way? You see, your life should be a message. They're going to you. You wouldn't have to say a single word, but by the way you live, it should it should show. Show forth the glory of God. And the grace of God. Him working in you. Working on you. And working through. If your faith is placed in Christ. If the Holy Spirit's having his way. You, you're not going to be silent. You're going to stand up. And you're going to say. This is right and this is wrong. According to the word of God. You see this is our authority. I don't have to say because I think it says this. I can say it says this. Mm. Homosexuality is a sin. Living together before marriage is a sin. 
on and on and on, stealing, killing, it's a sin. But the greatest sin of all is still somewhat in the heart and life of even the believer. We say we're a believer, but the greatest sin of all is that of unbelief. Do you really believe this word? I mean every last line. Every bit of it. You're not tearing out a page here and there because it doesn't fit your church doctrine. You know, there are a lot of churches today. We don't like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That goes out the door. Oh, speaking in tongues? Mm -mm, no. Prophesying? No. We're tearing out that page. You know, when they tear those pages out, they add things to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's, what's the book of Revelation tell us? You take away from it, you add to it, he's going to add to you those plagues, those, that, that wrath. I'm going to hold to this word and yes. this word alone. Even if I don't understand it, even if I don't quite get it, I'm going to go before him and say, Lord... I don't get it. Don't be afraid to tell him you don't understand. Right. I don't get it, but I'm trusting you, God. The Holy Spirit will lead you. Yes, Lord. He will teach you. That's what he's there for. The grace of God that teaches us. Grace of God that enables us. The grace of God. The power of God at work in our hearts and our life. Grace and peace came by Jesus Christ. Amen. It all comes through the blood. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. So I need to remind you again what you place your faith in, that you have made your God. Mm. Whatever you're trusting in is your God. Is it your job? Your money? Your bank account? Whatever. You made that your God. <clears throat> Wherefore come out from among them. And be ye separate. You see that's the work. That the Holy Spirit through grace. Is trying to work in each one of our hearts and lives separating us from sin, separating us from the world, and separating us to God, bringing us out from there and placing us in His very presence. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. It tells us that we can touch it. it. tells us that we can have part in it. If we do, we're not going to know. Mm. We're not going to have that grace that we need working in our hearts and our lives. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Yes. The grace of God yes. is God at work in our hearts and in our lives by means of the Holy Spirit because of what Christ did for us at Calvary and our faith there. Amen? Amen? Let God's grace do its work in your heart and in your life today. Don't think grace just covers it like peanut butter and jelly. That's the only way I can think of to, to put it. Some want to call it greasy. I don't want to call it that. Because God's grace is never just slathered on and covering up your sin. God's grace is the enabling power to live a life free from the dominion of sin and from those very acts of sin that weigh us down yeah. on a continual basis. God's grace is that power to find out sin that's still there that we may not even know of. Where we're all, what does the Word of God tell us? We all are coming short of the glory of God. <clears throat> that was written to believers. Mm. For all have come short of the glory of God. And are coming short is the way it's written. We are continually.
coming short. But the grace of God working in us and through us brings us a little bit closer. Moment by moment, day by day, let His grace have its work in your heart and life. Amen? Let's stand. Thank you.